All right, what's going on, everybody? Today we are here with Mr. Ashley Underwood, previous employee of Marvel Comics, and today we're going to talk about his artwork and his past history at Marvel Comics. So let's talk about uh, Marvel Comics in the 90s. How has uh, comics changed since the 90s compared to 2012? It's actually insane. It's, it's quite different. There's a lot the same. Uh, my son is really into the comic situation now, so it's pretty cool to be a walking encyclopedia for him. But you have a lot of the old characters, a lot of the new stuff. What I do notice is that a lot has changed as far as the actual character. You see a lot more darker characters, but a lot of it is still the same. And in fact, if you read a lot of the stories, it's the same rehashed. <laughs> Just another, it's the exact same comic all over again. They kind of stretch it as far as they can. Okay, awesome, very cool. So were you always a colorist, or did you start off as a drawing comics, or how, how did that work out? I started off working for Steve Jackson Games as an illustrator for one of their role-playing games called GURPS, okay. and another game, which is a board game called Auditor Quarterly. Um, then I worked for an independent publisher. In fact, we started a comic book company here in Austin called Adhesive Comics, um, too much coffee man comics like that. Um, and then just through various channels, I met Marvel Comics, folks at Marvel Comics, and started doing uh, coloring for them. Awesome. Okay. Now, I'm sure there's plenty of uh, answers for this question, but what was one of your favorite characters to work on while being at Marvel? Colossus from the X-Men. He's actually always been my favorite character. There's just something so cool about him. A stoic, pretty cool character. Um, throughout your career, who's been one of the most iconic people you've worked with? I've done a lot of pinup work. And so I'd have to go back and look at some of the artist's names. I think I've colored for a pinup of John Romita Jr. Um, his dad was John Romita Sr., super important person in the whole aspect of the Spider-Man uh, franchise, if you will. Would you mind showing us some of your work? Yeah, definitely. Here's one that I did, which was Age of Apocalypse. Uh, this was a coloring gig for Marvel, and it was a uh, limited series that Marvel had done, basically a what-if type future. Marvel is real famous for this what-if type of right. um, universes and environments. So you colored the whole comic, correct? The whole comic, that's correct. And it takes about how many hours to color Roughly the Roughly 32 pages, it depends. I mean, you can crank out, it depends on how detailed you can go overboard, but the idea is to get 32 pages knocked out within two weeks. Um, that's a lot of long nights yeah. you're trying to get detailed. Now, actually, the coloring process is almost mimicking the Henry Ford style of comic book production in its own little microcosm that's coloring. Very cool. Very cool. This is one of my favorite ones, Cage T-3000, which is basically <laughs> a Roger Corman space women prison knockoff. I totally dig this one. <laughs> and the cover is actually done by Coop, right? Punk Rock Poster yeah. Coop, which I love his artwork. I love his grade. This is just so... <laughs> It's such exploitation, it's just yeah. horrible, right? So let's look at I mean, sexual what do we have in the there? Innuendo here, right? Oh. We've got some prison chicks that are not in prison garb and a nun, a space <laughs> nun. I mean, obviously this is going nowhere good, right? right? I don't think I could color this around my kids. And we actually, back in the 90s, we went with the way of gimmicks because everything in Marvel was gimmicks. You know, you'd have multiple covers and stuff like that, so. At the time, we were looking, our numbers weren't that good. We were looking at a way, I mean, the stories were funny, but we were looking at, we were looking for a gimmick. Right. And I had read something back, because Austin is a huge hub for underground press, mm -hmm. back with the Freak Brothers and all that. And I'd read a magazine that where it briefly mentioned something where they had shot a magazine and they sold it. This is back in the 60s, and nobody remembered that. I thought, well, that's a great gimmick. So I brought it up at one of our meetings, and I said, well, shit, let's just shoot it. Everybody's like, that's ridiculous. Who's going to buy a shot comic book? Well, we decided to do it. So basically, if we, you know, we're going to shoot it. We're going to advertise it. This is not a die cut. This is a real bullet that went through this gun, and it's going to be kick ass. And we sold, we sold out. I mean, it was the ultimate gimmick. Dude. My actual story, Split Face, was changed into the Eden Matrix, right? <laughs> so this was um, Days of Comics' first full-color book, gory cover. Um, we actually had a sponsor there, Z-Rock 98.9. That was awesome. Wow. Um, but then this is the whole book done in, co in cover. This was before I started working for Marvel that I was doing these. And so this is all drawn, the majority of the inks, I drew it, the majority of the inks are mine, and most of the coloring is mine, but we were working with other people as well to color it. It's really, 
so close to the Matrix, it's kind of sick. But this is before the Matrix came out, and there's a huge backstory to that. This is oh. an interview for another time. Um, but basically, some guy realizes that, you know, here he thinks he's in Coney and Land, he ends up with his head blown off. Then he realizes he's somewhere, he comes into being, he realizes, holy shit, I'm inside of a computer. Well, he slowly realizes he's inside of a computer, oh my gosh. right? So, it's, did, did, so did the Matrix know about this um, comic? I'm not at liberty to discuss that. Oh, you can't tell us? I can't say Oh, that. that's exclusive, man. That's exclusive, buddy. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. When I got through my divorce, um, this is when the market fell out. I was doing a comic book for the local paper here, the Austin American Statesman, and so what it was, was I came up, I divorced my wife, I still had a five-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. So to pay my child support, I invented Divorce Squad. And Divorce Squad is the imagined stories, trials and tribulations of me and my daughter in everyday life, dressed wow. as superheroes. Wow. And basically just bagging on my ex-wife and then using the money from that to pay her for the child support. Genius. Which was an additional slap in her face. And that's just mean, you know, I mean, we're friends now. But she didn't like looking at the comic book every Thursday morning, yet my daughter made her go pick them out. Well, you know, artists make songs about ex-girlfriends and ex-wives, so what's the difference? That's he just right. shows your... <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so, Divorce Squad went for about 20 episodes, you know, and they're, they're cliche and goofy. But it was a way, I guess it's cathartic to get all that crap out, get yeah, it on paper, the therapeutic. make a little yeah. money and yeah. give it to her. Why did you leave Marvel Comics? The bottom of the market fell out and the work dried up. Would I love to get back in? Of course, absolutely. Give my left nut for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Ashley. We appreciate you here at Boycott Magazine, and we're out.